Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Elliot Mason, author of The Legal Killer. Elliot, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, The Legal Killer, how would you describe the novel? Um, my novel is a suspense thriller that uh, actually uses real data, but uh, and but through a fictional story tells about uh, the corruption in one of our biggest uh, governmental agencies, the uh, the Department of Justice. And, and oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was saying that the uh, it's done through the story of the pursuit of a serial killer. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing The Legal Killer? Um, yeah, actually, I do. I read a story one time about a um, a, a senator, or I, I believe it was a senator, in or some a member of Congress up in Alaska who was being investigated, uh, and he was charged with a crime. And it turns out that the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, which is obviously as part of the, uh, the DOJ, uh, it turns out that the U.S. Attorney's Office knew that he was innocent and actually purposely withheld uh, evidence that would have proved his innocence. And although he was eventually exonerated, it ruined his life and his family's lives. And, of course, there was absolutely zero punishment for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, they basically committed felonies in prosecuting this case. And I thought to myself, how is this possible? How is it that an agency that is meant to protect us is actually maybe our greatest enemy and that they're allowed to go out and ruin someone's life knowingly do it and, and have no uh, repercussions whatsoever. And I'm curious, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your debut novel published? Um, I had been writing uh, basically for websites and trade magazines for some time. Um, and, uh, I, I basically, I, I first found an interest in, in writing when I was in high school, but I was too shy to show anything that I wrote to anybody because I didn't think it was any good. And even though my parents, uh, kept on saying, oh, you ought to try, you know, pursuing this, you know, being a typical teenage kid, it was like, ah, oh, it's just mom and dad. What do they know? Um, and then when I got into college, I noticed that people started taking more notice of my writing, but again, I never really considered it as a career option. And I did uh, writing on the side again, as I mentioned earlier, for trade magazines and things of that nature, blogs. Uh, eventually I did electronic web, you know, media websites, things of that nature. However, it, it I, I always had this idea in the back of my mind that maybe I would try to pursue a novel. Uh, my parents and my family members were always pushing me to do it. And finally I, uh, decide to, you know, dive into the deep end of the, of the pool and, and try this, uh, this new career of trying to be a novelist. But again, it was kind of a long journey. I didn't actually start until I was in my forties. And, and how was it different from some of the writing that you were doing on websites? And if I'm not mistaken, you're a history professor, how was novel writing compared to, uh, that? It was different from the standpoint that I, um, I was never interested in writing like a biography or um, documentarian type of books. I, I was, for me, it was, I, I always been fascinated with, with the uh, fictional, but uh, kind of like Dan Brown type narratives where you take a, a real history and then move it into a fictional uh, story. And so it was, it was very different from the standpoint that I had to, create these characters and forced to do something where I'm creating a, a story, a narrative around this, uh, this whole world that I've created, which when you're writing for websites or you're doing content writing or something like that, that's what I call directed writing, which means that you are basically assigned a topic and you write on the topic and you stay within that, those were within that, uh, parameter, I guess you would say. Um, but yeah, it's creating this whole new world. It's very different. Uh, and not being afraid to put any idea down on paper, no matter whether you think it's a good idea or not. Sure. And I'm curious, what was your writing process for uh, your earlier novel and now the legal thriller? Are you someone who sits um, down and writes an outline before you write the first word? Or do you literally sit down to a blank page and start writing? 
I'm very, it's probably closer to the latter thing that you mentioned. I'm very undisciplined when it comes to <laughs> outlining. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm lazy when it comes to outlining. Basically, my process is I'll come up with an idea for a scene. And I may not even know what the topic of the book is. I might think of a general idea, but I come up with an idea of a scene and then I will write that scene out. And I have no idea whether that's going to be in chapter one or chapter 41. I couldn't tell you. I just write it out. And I do that repeatedly uh, over weeks and months even. And then after I have enough of those basically in a, um, I guess you would call a messy pile on my desk, I try to go through uh, these papers and I look through them and I try to see where there's a connecting thread. And then I gradually weave it into a, a story. So it's kind of a, um, it's a, it's a very haphazard process. I might say, uh, I always admire the people that can do the outlines. I really do. <laughs> I wish I could, but I'm too lazy. <laughs> sure. Well, are you working on another novel now? Uh, yes, I am. I'm actually working on a novel that is a, again, a suspense thriller, but deals with the, uh, uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict and its implications here in the United States and worldwide. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are listening, who are working on their own stories and novels? Um, not to be afraid to put anything down on paper. Uh, I always say to, to uh, people who want to write a book, sit down and just write the first thing that comes to mind. Don't worry about whether or not it's perfect. Don't worry about um, whether or not you know where it's going to go. Uh, I often say try to shy away from writing in a linear fashion, meaning that uh, you shouldn't write chapter one, then chapter two, then chapter three, and so on. Write whatever comes to mind. And it's okay to have several ideas going at once because if you have several scenes that you've written out, even if you might go through that writer's block, which we all go through, on one particular scene, another one might spark interest. Um, so I always say uh, to people who are deciding that they're going to write a book, that they need to really focus on just getting things down on paper. The other thing I always recommend is I always recommend to write things out longhand. Uh, and the reason I recommend that, they've done studies that they that have shown that people who write longhand instead of typing on a on a computer that this uh it brings out the creativity and what i also find is it slows down your thinking process a little bit so you don't get ahead of yourself so that would be my two main recommendations is to never write in a linear fashion put everything down on on paper as it goes and to write things out longhand I'm curious, when you started writing novels in your 40s, as you mentioned earlier, were there specific novels or writers that inspired you? You mentioned Dan Brown. Were there others? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was uh, James Elroy. I'm a big fan of James Elroy. Mm -hmm. uh, his writing is is so raw. Uh, uh, he wrote, I'm sure you uh, you know of it, L.A. Confidential. Yes. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk, who wrote uh, Fight Club, which I find his work really uh, fascinating. Cancer. So many lives are touched by cancer. In fact, one in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer. At the American Cancer Society, we're on a mission to free the world from cancer. It's a big mission, driven by little things like a ride to treatment, a free place to stay, a 24-7 helpline. But these little things are really the big things because to a cancer patient and their family, they're everything. And every day we reach thousands of cancer patients who so desperately need these services. But we need your help to get these critical services to more people and families in need this holiday season. Go to cancer.org and join the fight against cancer. It takes just minutes to donate and help provide essential support to cancer patients and their families. Don't wait. More than one in three people will be diagnosed with cancer. Go to cancer.org right now and make a difference. Go to cancer.org. Uh, later on, there's a writer by the name of Don Winslow who wrote a book called The Force, which I find to be fantastic. Uh, so those are the writers that kind of inspired me. Um, and I did mention Dan Brown. I, I love Brown's um, attention to detail, how he paints a picture. So like if he, he writes a, a scene where you're inside a museum, you can almost smell what the museum uh, smells like. I mean, it, it, it's so raw. It's so real. And, and I, I enjoy that about those particular writers. 
Sure. What what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Well, um, the one that I, I just mentioned, uh, Don Winslow was the force was, I thought was, uh, excellent. Uh, the, that was probably the, I, I just, I read it once before and I loved it so much. I reread it. So that would probably be the one that uh, is impacting me the most. I try when I'm in the middle of writing a book, oftentimes I, I try to be careful what I read because a lot of times I'll find myself being overly sure. influenced. And so, and I think that happens with a lot of writers. I was talking to a very prominent screenwriter who was starting to read my book and said, I have to put your book down because if, if I read it, it's going to, you know, overly influence what I do. So I haven't been reading a ton of stuff recently, but, uh, Winslow is, is uh, one of the, uh, the, the go-tos. Um, and the, ironically, I've been going back to classics. Uh, I, 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 started reading farewell to arms again which i hadn't read since uh since high school but uh, i mean you know you can do a lot worse than reading reading uh ernest hemingway to be influenced by someone obviously so Absolutely. but i i enjoy reading uh classics and revisiting those things that i haven't read since i was in college which was a thousand years ago so um it uh, that i i find gives me some kind of um i don't know motivation to improve the quality of my work Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels and your latest novel, The Legal Killer? Uh, they can find out uh, uh, about um, all my work and all my information. Uh, then go to my website's the best way. It's elliotmasonbooks.com. And there they can uh, see, uh, read about my books, uh, interviews I've done, appearances that I might be making, although with the pandemic, I haven't been doing a lot of that lately, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, uh, appearances as well as they can sign up for, a, uh, I have a newsletter that I put out about once a month. They can sign up for the newsletter. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Elliot Mason, author of the new novel, The Legal Killer. The novel is on sale now. So go buy a copy. And Elliot, thanks for doing this interview. Awesome. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief reading from The Legal Killer by Elliot Mason. Patricia stood up, pulling slightly on her gray suit and touching the back of her chestnut brown hair, which came together in a tight, small bun at the base of her neck. Grabbing her papers off the table, she strode confidently to the podium. Like most government attorneys, her statements were prepared from a template that the Department of Justice had approved for each type of case. Originality was not something such an entity endorsed. Clearing her throat, she began, Your Honor, I realize this is the first offense the defendant has committed. However, we have community standards that are in place, guidelines that have been set forth to prevent the proliferation of this terrible problem. Therefore, it's the government's position on the two counts that he should receive a 240-month sentence. The judge fidgeted in frustration. Ever since the 1980s, their power in making the determinations they were hired to make had been greatly diminished. The defendant had no criminal history, and the total monies he had accumulated in his drug activities amounted to a little over $7,000. It was a paltry sum. The young attorney kept a good poker face, trying not to let on to the fact that she was already recalculating her conviction rate in her head. This will look good on a resume, she thought. The system allowed her that luxury. Patricia had no illusions that she would get what she was asking for, but it didn't matter. The judge's hands were tied. He couldn't go below the mandatory minimum, yet knowing his ego, he would want some say in the matter. As his gavel came down with a definitive whack on its wood tablet, Patricia smiled with the 12-year sentence administered. She could report to her superiors that she had upheld their mandate. Gathering her papers, she turned in time to see the marshals handcuff the defendant. To his right, she saw his mother, wife, and young son in tears as they watched their loved one removed from the courtroom. It was a familiar scene, and at one time it had affected her. Yet after three years of reminding herself that the defendants had committed crimes, she had become hardened, immune to the wreckage left in its wake. The young prosecutor turned away, not wanting to endure the hatred in the family's glare. She knew this man was not a hardened criminal. He was simply a person who made a poor choice. I don't make the rules. I just enforced them, she told herself, as she pushed through the small flapping dividers, bypassing the pews, and exiting the courtroom into the hallway. The floors of the featureless passage glistened as she proceeded toward the elevators. 
The only thing accompanying her was the sound of her shoes tapping on the tile and her rolling briefcase being pulled in tow. She removed her cell phone from her pocket, eager to let her boss know the outcome of the sentencing. She was beginning to make a name for herself. Although she had little of any actual trial experience, she had proven her ability to obtain the desired results. After exiting the elevator, she made her way through the lobby and then exited the building through its tinted glass doors. Her pace quickened as she headed in the direction of the parking structure, bolstered by the words of praise from her superior. Patricia was going to celebrate tonight, dinner with friends, perhaps a nice bottle of wine. Opening up her car door, she threw her briefcase onto the front passenger seat. It was a chilly spring night, and she adjusted the heat accordingly. She was glad daylight savings time had kicked in. The shorter days always made her feel like she was working longer hours. Patricia was just about to put the car in reverse, never seeing the hands until the knife was pressed against her throat. She froze instinctively. Take whatever you want, she gasped. The breathing of her abductor was deep and rhythmic. She could smell the leather gloves, one on her forehead and the other below her chin. The glimmer of the knife reflected the dim yellow garage lights into her eyes. Here, my purse is in the front seat. You can have it, she pleaded. You only have one thing I want, a voice whispered in a raspy tone. She trembled. Her face was moist with perspiration as she could feel her captor's hot breath against the back of her neck. Do you know what I want? The abductor asked. She closed her eyes, trying to ascertain what the answer would be. That kind of violation was unimaginable. Please, do you have to? You still don't know? Her captor answered with an anger resembling that of someone on the receiving end of a personal insult. I don't understand. I don't know what you mean. I want your penance. I don't understand, she panted, the knife starting to break the skin near her jugular. Her eyes watered as she felt the slow trickle of blood dribbling down her neck and then staining her blouse. I will give you my penance. Please, I will. You don't even know what it's for, the kidnapper growled. It's for the label you carry. Accept responsibility. Label? What label? Felon, the voice said in a long, drawn-out hiss. The knife sunk deeply into her neck, and that sharp sensation was followed by the air exiting her body. She wanted to scream, but no sound was forthcoming. The life quickly drained from her as the blood gushed from the fatal wound. Her last thoughts were of the courtroom and the career that would never be realized. Her body went limp as it fell forward and all was silent and dark. Cancer. So many lives are touched by cancer. In fact, one in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer. At the American Cancer Society, we're on a mission to free the world from cancer. It's a big mission, driven by little things like a ride to treatment, a free place to stay, a 24-7 helpline. But these little things are really the big things because to a cancer patient and their family, they're everything. And every day we reach thousands of cancer patients who so desperately need these services. But we need your help to get these critical services to more people and families in need this holiday season. Go to cancer.org and join the fight against cancer. It takes just minutes to donate and help provide essential support to cancer patients and their families. Don't wait. More than one in three people will be diagnosed with cancer. Go to cancer.org right now and make a difference. Go to cancer.org. 